All right, where was it? All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate to see an audience. It is 5.31 p.m. on Tuesday, March 7, 2023, and I now call to order the City College Place Council Workshop. Jerry, we please take roll call. Mayor Hernandez. Present. Council Member Jessup. Present. Council Member Cleveland. Present. Council Member Espinoza. Council Member Williams. Present. Council Member Sherman. Present. And Council Member Boyle. Present. We do have a quorum. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Okay. Will you all please join me for Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, God, indivisible. Thank you. All right, it's now time for public comment. Did anyone submit a comment ahead of time? I did not receive any comment. Okay, if there's anyone in attendance, is there anyone in virtual attendance? There's no one in the Okay, if anyone in attendance would like to speak at this time, please step up to the seat. <laughs> Um, you want to do a public comment? Oh, no, no, no. no. Okay. You're, doing... You're on the agenda. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. No worries. All right. Then let's move on to the workshop topic. Get the shows on the road. We have five uh, items tonight. No actions will be taken. Uh, first, we have the Walla Walla Valley Blue Zones Tobacco Policy by Ms. Tim and Ms. Richards. I'm going to go on and pass these around. Okay. Great. Thank you. Well, I could be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having us today. I'll go ahead and kick us off. My name is Krista Tim. I am the Behavioral Health Program Specialist at the Walla Walla County Department of Community Health. That is an overarching title to say that I am the Regional Youth Cannabis and Commercial Tobacco Prevention Program Coordinator. We love to talk in acronyms at my job. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Lucinda Richards. I am a school recovery navigator and I'm primarily contracted with College Place High School and I'm a master level counselor intern with Trilogy Recovery Community. Welcome ladies. Thank you. So I, um, as mentioned, I'm the Youth Cannabis and Commercial Tobacco Program Coordinator and that is funded through the Department of Health. Um, I'm the Regional Coordinator for the Greater Columbia Region, which is the nine counties in the Southeastern Washington from Whitman County to Osso into Tri Cities and then up towards Kittitas. Um, but I'm also the local coordinator for tobacco and cannabis work here in the county. Uh, my work focuses primarily on policy, systems, and environmental changes. Um, later, I'll talk about we also have coalitions and they focus on the direct service portion of the prevention work. Um, before we get too deep into this presentation, it's important to note that Washington State is one of two states in the county, in the country, um, where we have preemption in four of our main policy areas. That basically means our local governments can't have stricter rules in these four categories than our state government. And so those four categories are advertising, licensing, smoke-free indoor areas, and youth access. Um, that is most of the work that tobacco policy happens in. And so it's really important when we get the opportunity to weigh in on state legislature. Um, it's also important to say that our funding for prevention has decreased steadily over the last, since we got the big settlement of tobacco funds. Last year, we received $4,000 as a county to do tobacco prevention work. Um, how do you do anything with $4,000? Um, this most recent fiscal year, we um, Jay Inslee gave us a five gave Department of Health a five million dollar um, bump for tobacco prevention work, and once distributed among all of the regions, Walla Walla County only got eleven thousand dollars. And so, um, and next, and that funding was a one time promise, and that funding is still well below CDC recommended levels. Um, so that's what we're I'm advocating for at a different level. 
um, for more work. But that's why, so next year we're probably only gonna get 4,000 again, uh, which is why it's important that I rely on people like Lucinda working at Trilogy and Blue Zones to help me get the work done because I can't can't do it alone on $4,000. Okay, some of the stuff we have done so far as we assess current signage and updated language in parks and schools and college place. We've also created healthier spaces through policy change. And the number one that we've done so far is the college place farmers market. And we have done the STARS standardized tobacco assessment at retail settings. And some of the results that we found for Walla Walla and College Place is that 26 of tobacco retail locations are within one mile of the school. 62% sell synthetic nicotine products. 96% sell flavored products. Seven stores are advertising products within three feet of the floor. 54% are selling e-cigarettes and 15% of e-cigarettes are located within 12 inches of toys, candy, or ice cream. I know, it's pretty great. <laughs> I was pretty shocked too. Uh, some of the takeaways from the STARS assessment is that retail locations are marketing towards use. Advertisements and nicotine products are at eye level and they are near candy, toys, and ice cream. Flavored products are targeting use and many are selling synthetic nicotine products that are not regulated. Um, so as Lucinda said, we, um, Blue Zones actually, had a intern bike around to all of the parks in the city of College Place and in Walla Walla, and he was looking at um, how many signs are located, all of the parks in Walla Walla County are smoke-free. Um, so he was biking around to see how many signs they have, are the signs in English and in Spanish, are they, do they include vaping, often people don't think smoking means vaping. Um, and what are the conditions of those signs? And so as a result, we um, partnered with Parks and College Place Park, Parks and Rec. Um, and we put some, I'm sorry, you guys are oh, we we one have... slide back from the PowerPoint. Um, but we had Parks and Rec help us update the signs. And so we actually got 27 new signs installed um, in the parks. In, and that's just in College Place. And um, they're in English and in Spanish, and we added language around vaping. Some of the other signings we have done is we ordered 50 window cleans for College Place High School. I'm pretty sure Mr. Jess was saying them. Uh, so there was, I was putting some uh, no smoking uh, signs up in the bathrooms, and kids were ripping them down. So <laughs> I was like, I need to find another way to make, keep these signs up. So I talked to the assistant principal, Ms. Bryant, and I was like, what can I do? And she's like, reach out to Mr. Rake, see what, if you can get some students to design something. So he got a couple of students that design, designed the signage for us, and they haven't been torn down. So that's a real success in our books. I'm so proud of that. Yeah. We love to get, when we're ordering signs for people, we don't want to just say, here's this general template sign. We want to have as much buy-in as possible. And so whenever possible, we try to have them help design the signs for us. Makes it more fun. Um, so that is what we did last year. Um, this year, we are looking off of the Healthy Use Survey data. And so the Healthy Use Survey is taken every other year. Um, yeah, every other year by, 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th grade students. So it follows the same cohort throughout and it's anonymous. And they throw in questions like fake drugs to see if kids say yes, and then they'll throw them out. And then they also ask at the end of the survey, were you honest? And so if they say no, they'll also throw those out. Um, so they have lots of tests for validity. Um, but the 2021 survey states that 26% of our Walla Walla County youth are vaping. Um, that's 10% higher than in 2016, which is the last time they asked that question, and it's 11% higher than the state average, um, which is a little bit concerning for Walla Walla County. Um, but this survey matches up to what we were hearing. I was invited by the governor's office to join a call with admin from around the state who work in schools, and I was shocked. Like I thought it was just kind of like a Eastern Washington thing. But schools in the eastern and the western side of the state, they um, they have principals standing at the bathroom doors. They close bathrooms during passing periods, which is 
getting kind of HRE if you're closing the bathrooms. Um, and they're only letting one person in the bathrooms at a time. And they're just spending so much ad admin time stand standing at these bathrooms. Um, so that's what we're hearing around the state. But Lucinda, what are you? Uh, school. Yeah, there is a lot of vaping going around in the bathrooms, also the school locker rooms. Uh, kids are also using the bathrooms to hide uh, substances under the trash cans to kind of like exchange. That's what I heard. <laughs> no, it's just, it's kind of crazy. Um, but we're doing all, we're hearing all this, but what are we doing? So um, a, a few weeks ago, Walla Walla uh, Public Schools brought in Hidden in Plain Sight. That's a training from the trainers from Tri-Cities and she comes in and she sets up a mock bedroom and she has a whole bunch of risk factors hidden in there and then vaping devices hidden and other things. And she asks people to kind of look around the room. And then she also, and then after that 30 minute presentation, it's not to insinuate, you should go look for your kids' rooms. Um, but then after that, she goes in for an hour and a half about um, what the data is looking like in Walla Walla and how you can talk to your kids. And um, I don't know, Lucinda attended the presentation. What do you think? So as a parent that has a teenager, I was really curious and working with teens. I was like, what's the new trends, right? So you know that they have a vape pen that looks like a USB drive now? Oh my goodness. And yeah. a highlighter. Yeah, I was like, so I, I learned actually a lot of things. Also, have you guys heard of alcohol vaping? <laughs> yep, that's a thing now. So they put in the alcohol in a water bottle. And you know, like those things like for blowing up a balloon, it kind of looks like that, but some weird bike pump. Yeah, bike pump thing. And they keep doing that until the alcohol comes up and it just vape and then it's sucking it up. And they're not realizing that it's going to 100% to their bloodstream and kids are overdosing. So it's primarily in uh, college colleges students. right now, but it's not going to take that long for it to drink though. So these are some things that I learned at Hidden and Plain Sight, and I think it would be really good for college place for parents and staff members to attend this training it's very important yeah so we're working with the college place prevention coalition to bring that training to um, our school district and college place as well as community members anybody who wants to go and so we're thinking about maybe uh, definitely before june we'll have this presentation but hopefully um, on april September. um so we have our local coalition college place prevention coalition um, they are moving and shaking. They're also going to have a town hall. I think they're um, talking about opioids as well. That is a big problem in our community as well. Um, and then what my program is doing is we are looking at community norms. And so we did some community surveys last year in College Place for adults. And so we asked them what their perceptions of student use is. And then we also have the Healthy Youth Survey that asks what the student's reality around substance use is. And so this positive community or messages is hoping to change some of the adult perceptions and show them what reality is and the kids. Kids like to blend in with what other kids are doing. And so although 26% of 12th graders that vape is pretty high, that means 74% are not vaping. And so the positive community norms is saying 74% of kids are not vaping. Be like the 74%. And so uh, we're working around that media campaign and that should be out. Um, and then we're also promoting our statewide quit line. That's a free resource to anybody in Washington state. There's also the Tomorrow Quit app, um, which is also free for Washington state residents. You just have to say that you live in Washington. Um, and then we also have some quit kits available at the health department because quitting is really hard. And so we have like a water bottle, um, benefits of quitting. College Place students actually wrote notes of hope um, to those who are trying to quit substances. And those are in the kits as well, and gum and toothpaste and all the fun stuff. Um, and whenever possible, we try to get youth involved. We talk all about this prevention and drug prevention, but it doesn't mean anything unless the kids have their own buy-in. And so, Lucinda, do you want to talk a little bit about Red Ribbon Week? Uh, yes. So Red Ribbon Week, we've done that for the past two years at College Ridge High School in Sager, and it's been really successful. We had kids come up and say thank you for having some drug awareness because that hasn't been like a big thing in the school. So 
it's a drug awareness week and it's just a fun time where kids can come up and ask some questions about substances and get a prize it's nothing too crazy it's like a game so well last year college place um high school did a coloring competition for the billboard on myra road exit and so we picked a student from the high school and their drawing was on the billboard for six months which is also very cool if my drawing did it on billboard i be very happy. Um, so looking ahead uh, for next year, so we uh, we did that STARS assessment and we, although we can't make any formal rules or policies, we are hoping to set out a best practices list, um, such as don't put signs below three feet on the floor, because who, what adult looks three feet below the floor? It's just for kids. <laughs> um, and moving some of the tobacco items away out of the sight of candy and toys, um, and so we're just hoping to put out that best practices list. Um, we're also advocating for more state funding and um, we're gonna continue to educate parents and community members on how to identify products and how to talk to kids. Um, the most important thing is to talk to your kids. Um, if, if you are seen as a resource to them, then they'll wanna come talk to you. If you say, oh, I, did, I never did that or don't do that or your brain will look like fried eggs on drugs, they're not going to believe you if they then see someone else who's done the substance and their brain's not fried. So just be honest with them and talk to them frequently and set expectations. So talking, like figuring out how to talk to kids is some education that we're also doing. Um, we also hope to address some synthetic nicotine. Like Lucinda said, it's um, currently not regulated. Well, the FDA put some regulations in place uh, September of 2021. But we know how slow those compliance checks are around that. And preemption only um, applies to the vaping portion. At Super One, there was actually synthetic nicotine toothpicks. Um, and they're not an approved cessation method. They're just kind of out there. So even toothpicks nowadays have some nicotine in them. Uh, we're just going to continue to part partner with global coalitions. So that was a lot of us talking at you, but um, do you guys have any questions for us? I do. Yeah. So the high school seniors vaping the, the staff from 2016 to 2021 at the 26%. So I know that it's impossible to get like to date numbers and things, but do you guys believe that that number is actually higher? So in 2021, because it was during COVID, um, a lot of youth were separated from their peers and nicotine, to buy nicotine products or tobacco products, you have to be 21. So we think that we saw a dip in 2021. The 2023 survey comes out in October, and I think that number is going to jump a lot higher. Um, the school resource officer from Walla Walla Public Schools thinks that number is probably double. Ugh. But that's anecdotal. I don't know. We have any? Throw it out there. If you guys want to change things up, we are looking for teachers. If you guys are wanting to get involved here <laughs> and substitutes, so just that uh, fun little you know, opening there. I had two questions, if you don't mind. Uh, one: uh, what, what are like the state uh, regulations that would be hindering? your program from doing what we want to do if we're one of two states that we can't go above and beyond what the state asks. Are there, in, in brief, are there things that which you would, which could happen you think is effective in the state for this? Well, and like advertising for me is the number one thing. Um, I wish that we could not have tobacco advertising out on the streets. Um, so in the businesses? Yeah, in the businesses and on their property. Um, so advertising is a pretty big one. That's honestly my biggest one that I have. And then um, we, I also found out, I went to a conference in DC and Washington state is one of 26 states in the country that have smoke-free indoor policies. Um, so we're above average on that one. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, and then youth access, our compliance rates are also pretty low. And because we don't have a lot of funding at the health department, we can't go do compliance checks, which means the only people who can do them are LCB and our law enforcement, and law enforcement is pretty busy. Oh, I just want to ask. So a lot of the youth are buying uh, vape products online. 
So check a box if you're 21, right? Mm -hmm. And so ID check. So that's how a lot of the kids are getting stuff online. So I would like to see that more regulated. Maybe put a license number in there, you know? So stuff like that, and I would like to see that change. And um, with the flavored products, we also can't regulate flavors. And so there's fun flavors like cotton candy and wine and apple and gumdrop and and our state allows, but our state allows, and we have no um, that's something that when I first started this work with Emily, I wanted to cut back the flavored products. Even menthol mint is an enticing flavor to some, but the fact that we can't do any regulation on that is pretty hard. Um, it's circulated the floor at the state level a few years ago, but it just can't seem to get any traction. So I also noticed you guys are doing a lot more education, school support, so on and so forth. Have you already connected? Or if you have already, so I apologize. Um, have you guys already connected with Abel at school who's doing the adult education courses? Because he was looking for like blue zones or I know he's at the Katie a lot and getting uh, representation there for the adult education nights to help with that education as well. So Killer is involved in the, is it the DUI night or Oh, the DUI impact. Event. Yes, yeah. Trilogy is a part part of that. We go and talk to people. Are you talking about no, that? like Abel's doing the adult education uh -huh. and he's gotten about 15 parents there uh -huh. uh, just doing a multitude of uh, education nights. So he's mm -hmm. already got that connection. He's already got that relationship. He's already got people showing up. Um, is he with 21st Century? He is. Okay. Then the College Place Prevention Coalition has been working with Abel. I talked to him today. He's he's hoping that he wanted me to ask you guys okay. if you guys will come to one of those uh, courses and do uh, education for the adults that are coming. Yeah. So yeah. like, yeah. that's really nice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll email you him. I'll see him on Friday. Courtney Fuller. <laughs> yeah. uh, Courtney Fuller is the new coordinator, and so she when she brings it in in plain sight, um, maybe we can do it at one of his. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Anybody online? The quick kits. Yes. How does one go about getting those? Do, does it have to be a youth or can an organization go pick some up for the youth? I will gladly give some to the organizations. Okay. And just come to the health department. Um, I think my contact information might go through the questions. So maybe, probably not. I think um, I have your contact information. I work for the health center. Yeah. So I can get you. Emily, we were thinking about doing a presentation. Excellent. Yes. There we go. Okay. <laughs> we also have lock boxes available um, for parents who don't aren't ready to quite quit, but want to keep it out of the hands of youth and pets. Okay. No. All right. Anything else? Thank you both very much. Thank you. It was very informative. Thank Appreciate you. your time and your work. Thank you. It is very easy. All right. So next is the wastewater treatment plant update by Mr. McAndrews. Do we have Mr. Cavari online or is it just yes? Yeah. Is he? Yes. Right. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome. We just wanted to kind of provide a brief update on where we're at after our February 14th council meeting, where we talked kind of extensively about the <laughs> FCS group uh, proposal and in interlocal with the city wall wall. Um, so since then, we've continued conversations with the city wall wall. Um, we've engaged FCS group directly. Um, Alex and JV have been involved in these conversations. And we are working on coordinating a joint council meeting. I think we're looking at April 19th. Um, are we hosting that? We are hosting it. Yeah, that's the plan is that we'll host it here. Um, it'll be a joint council meeting that we've asked SCS group to put together kind of a, a presentation to come and talk about the various options, the, the renter, customer, owner are kind of three different options for, for some sort of joint user agreement, um, as well as we've asked them to kind of dive into kind of high level concepts of regionalization and, 
and the, the joint sewer district and whether that would include just the treatment facility or if it would include the collection system as well. So the idea is at a joint council meeting, everybody would be able to ask the same questions, hear the same answers, um, hopefully be able to look across the room at each other's faces and see how everybody's responding and get a feel for, for where everybody's at. But then as part of that, um, I think we'd also like to discuss at that meeting that the concept of kind of forming a task group, which would likely involve you know, two members from each council, um, both city administrators, public works directors, uh, representative from JUB, representative from Jacobs Group, who does um, manages the treatment plants, both city's treatment plants, um, to start, you know, planning visits to some other areas, some other treatment plants that have put together joint districts and ask questions, you know, what went well, what would you do differently, you know, you really kind of get a feel for, for how things went. So um, all of that to say, there's gonna be a lot more to come, I think at the April 19th joint meeting. Um, Alex, if you're online, did, did you have anything to add or did I cover it pretty well? No, I think you covered it perfectly. So I guess all of that, any questions at this point? <laughs> any questions? Is this on a Wednesday, April 19th? That's a, on a Wednesday, April 19th. Um, I think we're aiming for 4 p.m. Yeah. That was uh, the time that Walla Walla kind of suggested slash requested. So that's what we are working with, hopefully. Council Member Williams would like to speak. Council Member Williams? Um, so in getting ready to, uh, put that workshop together, um, would it be helpful to have, uh, council members send in essentially, you know, these are concerns that we have or questions or areas that we think we need to have considered? Yeah, I think that'd be a great yeah. idea. Um, if you have specific questions in advance that you'd like to talk about, um, that would be a good opportunity if you send them in. It, this this particular discussion with the FCS group is is um, it's going to be pretty high level. So we may not be able to have answers to those questions at the meeting, but it would certainly be good to know what they are so we can kind of have conversations surrounding them. I guess well, kind of the and and I guess my kind of question it is. I think fairly high level, it's, you know, how are we going to organize the necessary conversations? Because I, I see, and I don't know if I'm missing things, I may be, but um, there's the technical work that needs to be done. There's financial, um, there's legal, and then there's political. And all of those are going to influence each other. Um, but I think we need to kind of lay out some sort of a plan of how we're going to have the conversations in all of those areas, because it won't necessarily be the same people all the time um, talking about everything. Sure. I don't expect you to answer that now. I'm just saying that's kind of what I would like to see discussed at that meeting is how are we going to structure those? Um, I certainly don't expect you to have, you know, an answer right this second. That uh, I think they're, I think that's a valid question. I'm sure many other folks have questions as well. So, um, yeah, and I'd suggest we talk to FCS about that because they, I know they were involved, like, for instance, when Clean Water Services stood up, which covers uh, Washington County, and I think they may have been involved in a little bit of the lot assemblage, which is the regional wastewater, so they could probably provide uh, mm -hmm. some verbiage on how all of that came about because when those two came about, that was long before my time. Sure. So, Council Member Sherman would like to speak. Council Member Sherman? Um, I only have a question on the date because I understand it's hard to get a time when everybody can get together, but that evening is the Good Roads Association. We meet every other month, but it's 
uh, me from the city of college place. And I think three of the Walla Walla council members who all have to be in Kennewick at five 30. Okay. Hmm. So maybe they didn't know about that somehow. Should we expect this to be one of the I was just going to have that be the only item on the agenda, so that way. Yeah. Well, that'll be interesting because this is pretty important city yeah. business. So I'd be surprised if Walla Walla doesn't have three council members there. Yeah. Yeah. And yours was kind of they suggested. Yeah. Yeah, that seems weird to me. I just went to put it on my calendar, and that's what. So this was with conversations with their public works director, who had, I believe, spoken with their city administrator and their mayor and mayor pro tem. So um, maybe they had not consulted council yet. Could be. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, but we will we will confirm with them on that date. And if that's for sure the date that they want to do this. Yeah. Okay, well then I won't be able to be here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm uh, sorry. I could you repeat the date and time? I seem to have missed it. April 19th at 4 p.m. is what is tentatively being scheduled at this point. <laughs> when you get that confirmed, could you just send that out to all our emails? Yes, yeah, I think yeah, Sherry, yeah. Sherry's going to be working on that. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Robert or Mr. Fazari, do we know when Walla Walla is going to be having their sewer assessment done? Have they put a date on that? No. Their systems, because they haven't done what they're called. But like the wastewater facility. They, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think they have a firm date targeted for that. Um, right now, they're doing an assessment uh, looking at just one of the specific areas at their wastewater treatment plant, their anaerobic digesters. So that's a capital improvement plan they have in the works over the next couple of years. And um, when I spoke with their council, uh, maybe a, a couple of months ago, the plan that was discussed was this year focusing on that anaerobic digester study and then getting funding for that particular project and then waiting for uh, ecology to uh, provide a draft permit, and then they would start their facility plan. So I would guess probably 24, 25 is what they're thinking for their facility plan in terms of the timing okay. of that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Yeah. Jessup? Thank you for that, because that then makes me ask, in order for it to be a productive meeting, it seems as if if we have an hour meeting, and then by the end of it, we realize they don't have the information we need to make this a productive meeting. What is the timeline necessary for this that needs to get this ball rolling? And what is the information that really we need Wall Wall and us to have in order for this to be a productive meeting? And if right then the next step then would be well, do we can and if we do push out the meeting? So so this this particular joint council meeting is really intended to be informational so FCS can share in more detail what the the potential user agreement uh, like. yeah okay so it's more so less technical and more yeah, it, it, exact exactly it's trying to cover the various options and then i and then really it's also key at both councils in the room because as you're going through the options, I mean, like we looks on the faces of each side, we'll be able to essentially garner where everyone is at essentially on that. Because if everyone is still on board for like doing this like regionalization thing, then step two to this is honestly, I would say is uh, Robert said before, we really need like two apiece from each of the councils and the administration of each because we need to do, I would say, uh, visitation trips to areas that have done this successfully, which is like Washington County, Oregon, and then the Olympia area, ground truth, uh, and then come, and then that's probably going to form another list of questions. And the finite timeline on this is that with that master uh, finance agreement you all passed last week, we have basically until 
uh, that run into 2025, but that's ultimately the, the ramp where we're going to have to either regionalize or not regionalize because we're able to do the treatment plant, regardless of which way we go, there's filter improvements and stuff we have to do, which we'll do this year, but the state is essentially uh, with us going back and forth with them, the finite time frame in which regionalize or don't regionalize is the 2025. That's the new kicked out one. Got it. Thank you. I understand. Thank yeah. You. Are we going to need to rediscuss the interim contract that we kind of come that we take hold of? That we take, yeah, because uh, we misunderstood. Like, likely not at this point, maybe at some point. Um, okay. What we would we had kind of talked about was setting that aside for now okay because that really is to bridge the gap if we decide that we're going to be uh building the pipeline and sending tree to effluent to the city of walla walla the the time frame of that and the time frame of of finalizing and formalizing some sort of sewer district is likely going to take longer then at some point we're gonna have this pipeline put in place and we're gonna to need to send them effluent and we're gonna to have to figure out how that works. Sure. And so as we approach 2025 and kind of have a better idea, are we going to be going that direction? Are we not? Then we might want to reconsider that discussion about what would a temporary user agreement okay. look like. FCS is gonna cover that. The plan is to cover some of that at this joint council meeting. So we can kind of okay. have the conceptual um, understand it conceptually before we get there. But as far as taking it back to um, for a vote on are we going to do this or are we not going to do this, I think that's kind of being pushed down the road at this point. So it sounds like it might be a the times might match between um, Walla Walla doing their study mm -hmm. and us having to decide because I know we didn't want to decide until they had their study because we wanted to know what we were going to get into. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, 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 may, it may a little bit when wastewater facility plans take a while to put together. So, it, so I mean, uh, it may go beyond that 2025 window for their facility study. So, uh, just the pessimist in me is saying that. So it may, it may not depend. Uh, I think, I think what's key here though is that both uh, councils hear the presentation by FCS about what those options are. And I would hope after FCS really does a scroll down since they do this day to day and are the, they're really the only experts in this now in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, they uh, truly will be, will be able to tell what the level of interest is with everyone about the sewer district option. And then, uh, and the, and then the in-room in between that. So uh, that's what the hope is at least that, so everyone's in the same room and can hear that. I think it's still kind of hard because I think we, we have interest. Yeah, yeah. But, Contingent on that, yeah. that there's not a $75 million project that Walla Walla has to do, yeah. and then we get involved, and then we got to pay for half of well, that. Well, Alex, since you do a lot of their work, I mean, uh, too, with that plan, could yeah. you just allude? Uh, and if it's out of turn, don't have to, but if it's within the public paradigm, allude to if you feel that there's that kind of liability hanging out there, or if you feel that it is. Yeah, right. So I, I hear what you're saying, Mayor, and and I don't think that that is a concern. I think, um, you know, we've been doing the facility planning for them for, for over 20 years now. And um, with the plan that we're talking about in terms of you continuing to operate your treatment plant and just sending treated effluent to their plant, yeah, okay. you'll, really, you'll really only be utilizing a small portion of their plant. And so okay. I don't believe, we do know that at some point in the future, there will be some, some filtration requirements at their treatment plant. We don't know at what time in the future, but it's likely that that's the only project that College Place residents would need to help participate in when that happens in the future. And so I would be less concerned about 
uh, needing to know the results of the facility plan or less concerned about having some major upgrade that the residents would need to participate in. I would be more concerned about the willingness to even form a sewer district because that sounds to me, I listened to their comments from the council meeting before when this FCS group study was presented to you. And the concern was we don't wanna be just a customer of Walla Walla. We wanna form this joint sewer district. And I think the presumption was in terms of this timeline that it would take several years to form a sewer district. And so that's why we started off with this idea of, okay, if we head down this road, what would a user agreement look like? But rightfully so, you guys pumped the brakes on that and said, well, we might, we might need this, but we have some time to think about it. And as Robert mentioned, probably 2025 would be the appropriate time to look at what kind of a user agreement would be. Between now and then, we have two years to, to at least begin down this path of forming a joint sewer district. And so this meeting, I think, is the first step in that to test the waters and see how serious everybody is in forming a joint sewer district. Um, and, um, you know, really, it's looking at mostly the political piece <laughs> to start with, because I think if we can't get past the political piece and it doesn't make a lot of sense to really dive too much into the technical and financial. So I think this is a good approach from that perspective of let's make sure both Walla Walla and College Place are kind of walking hand in hand down this path of forming a joint sewer district. And two years from now, if there's a lot of momentum and we have a good feeling that this is where it's going, then we could enter into a, a temporary user agreement while we figure out the details. All right, thank you. That's helpful. Any other questions or comments? All right, I think we're, we got it. Thank I you, will, I will reach out to Walla Walla about that April 19th date and okay, confirm that on. is truly the date they'd like to do it. Okay. Alex, thank you for being here. Yeah, you bet. Now I'm going to go watch the Zags. Have a good evening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see next, Mr. Lam Lambar. Lambar. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. You're good. And, Mr. I, and I'm, I believe Jared Coulter is called in. And I actually brought um, the additional person, Mark Kaiser, with me if he could join me as well. So yeah, works. absolutely. Step on up. Or sit on up. <laughs> I know. So yeah, I'm Lane Lambarth. I'm with McKinstry. Um, we were the contractor or are the contractor that built uh, the solar array over at the booster station um, here in October. And so Robert and Mike asked me to come and speak to the incident that happened um, on the 29th. Um, I, I don't know if everyone, is everyone aware of what that is and what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, so just to provide a little summary of the, uh, after it was installed, there, there was an incident where some residents reported seeing some smoke over there and one of the panels essentially, uh, caught on fire over there. So fire department dealt with the, and then I asked uh, McKinstry staff to investigate this, figure out why and what needs to be done. So, yeah. And thankfully, we I'll go through the process that we went and where we're at. Um, but we did find root cause, which is okay. um, the you know the best solution. So, um, as you said, uh, so we have a two hundred thirty module um, arrays. 100 kW AC. Um, one of those modules um, did catch on fire on the 29th. We were called, um, something about a hold of Mark, Mark is the superintendent, um, kind of boots on the ground. And so we got a hold of him from the city, let him know. He got a hold of me. I talked to Mike the following Monday. This was a Sunday that it happened. Uh, right away, we wanted to get a team on site to look into you know, what the possible cause was. Um, just to be clear, this array was officially not what we would say in the connected. Um, it was not interconnected at the time that this happened. And so there was no additional safety you know, requirements for us to, to take um, at that time. But we did wanna you know, 
find out what happened, obviously. Uh, so we had um, three folks go down on the 31st. Um, so just two days after it occurred. And um, at that point, um, we just did a visual inspection. We didn't um, you know, take anything apart. We just took pictures, measurements, that kind of thing. And then came back and, and did further, further analysis. What we found was that um, one of the um, conductors had been mistakenly mislabeled and then um, was uh, basically created a short circuit because it was connected uh, incorrectly because of the mislabeling and created a, re a reverse polarity. Um, so basically human error is, is the root cause. Um, you know, uh, so the short circuit occurred, damaging the module, causing a thermal event, eventually combustion. Uh, thankfully, the only damage was to the module and to the um, wires connected to the module. Uh, this was a ground mounted system on asphalt. Uh, so, you know, thankfully we weren't looking at um, any rooftops or, you know, grass or anything like that around there. Um, so then um, after we, you know, we suspected that is what had happened from the visual inspection, we brought uh, the installer. So just to be clear, we subcontract an installer in Northwest Renewables to actually do the physical installation. They're the ones with the electricians and laborers putting the um, array together. We've worked with them on other projects, including on our own um, headquarter buildings in Spokane. Um, they have lots of experience. Um, so we brought them on site um, and looked at it together. They agreed with um, what we thought was the cause. And so at that point, we went ahead and had them fix um, how they had strung it to string it correctly. Um, we replaced the damaged conductors, the wires, and we also replaced four modules, uh, the one that was damaged and then three surrounding it just out of precaution. And we were able to do that right away because we did order um, extra. That's a practice that we do just because things come in damage. You know, you, we want to leave extras for you guys. Um, and so we use those, but we do have replacements coming to replace the ones that we used. Uh, so we did all of that, um, and then uh, at that point, uh, we redid the, so we do have polarity testing that is done. We redid that polarity testing um, and uh, called in for our final electrical inspection. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, we are going for... I'm actually, Mark and I will be out there tomorrow morning with the electrical inspector, at which point we should be given the green light to actually have uh, Pacific Power come and put in the final meter and do the interconnection. So that's where we are right now. Um, I do want to talk a little bit to, you know, what we have learned and are pointing to as contributing factors and the lessons that we've learned and, you know, what the actions we're going to take you know, going forward on other projects um, to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. So some of the contributing factors that we did notice um, was the, the contractor, as I already said, mistakenly uh, made a deviation from what Jared, the electrical engineer, um, had designed. Um, with that, it was partially due to their mislabeling. Um, so, as a practice, I'm going to get a little bit into the details of this. As a practice, negative use black, positive use red. They had ran out um, of the specific color that they needed. They went to the store to get some more, and they didn't have it. So, they just went ahead and used the black, which is used. This happens all the time um, in the electrical world. A lot of, you know, in housing, a lot of times they're just using different color electrical tape to indicate what phase, ground, um, whatnot. 
So in this case, they used red tape to indicate that the, the black wire was supposed to be positive instead of negative. We believe that was a contributing factor to them making a mistake. Um, you know, it's it, there's a lot of wires that go into, into something like this. And so, um, you know, hindsight 2020, we would say, no, you can't do that. And going forward, you know, we're gonna say in our specifications, you can't do that. There is no NEC code though, just so you guys know, that says they can't. They didn't break any rules. Yes. Yeah, so okay, so if they, if their practice thinks they couldn't get the one that is traditionally used, so they used the other, would there have been a step that could have been used to know what it actually was since the color coding wasn't accurate? So they had, go ahead. So <laughs> yes, okay. we're supposed to do this. Um, no, it, <laughs> you know, I, I've done multiple projects. I'm still learning because I'm not, you know, out there physically doing it myself. So they, they have a meter. Um, a voltage testing meter. And what we found, you know, so they did the voltage testing. Um, and I think what happened is it got misplaced after, like during the testing process. Um, we also found that the meter that they were using actually was not the proper meter. Um, so the, the meter they had was for um, a smaller size of. Um, and so, well, the meter they used was up to a thousand volts, yeah. and the strings out there are 13 to 1400 volts on the strings. Uh, the meter that they used, uh, it won't show you the exact voltage, but it will show you the polarity. reverse polarity. Yeah. So, even though they had the wrong meter, they can still check polarity with it to make sure that the polarity is correct. So, um, yeah. yeah the, if they had the other major meter, maybe you know, the voltage would have been an additional indication to them. It would have been. <laughs> 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 so clearly that means it's fine. Yeah, the clarity, yeah. However, had they, had they had the right voltage, they would have seen a difference in the voltage compared to the other strings, and they would have probably picked it out then until something else. Yeah. Um, That's what yeah, uh, so another thing, so that polarity testing is part of what we call our commissioning testing. There's some commissioning testing that is done by the installer, and then there's some that's done by a third party that comes in and that's their job is commissioning testing. Um, as a practice, we are supposed to have somebody on site and they're supposed to let us know when they're gonna be doing that commissioning testing so that we can observe it. They did not. Um, and so we didn't have anybody on site there observing it. Again, I'm just saying that's a contributing factor because I don't know, even if we did have somebody there, that we would have necessarily caught it. Um, but that's one of the things going forward that we're going to be like, hey, you have to let us know when you're doing this and we have to be there. Um, and so we're, you know, we're just kind of, making our, our specifications, our processes, our best practices a lot more stringent out of this lesson, um, you know, to make sure that, or to lessen the possibility of something like this happening. Um, at this point, you know, what's also I think interesting in this is that we had this array pretty much set up since the end of October. And this didn't happen until um, the, the 29th, which really indicates to me that the testing and the last steps that they were doing on the 29th is when this um, error occurred. Um, so they were here on the 29th? They were there on the, that Thursday. Yeah, they were there just before. Just before. Yeah, so okay. one of the other contributing factors is that that weekend was particularly cold and sunny. So it's just kind of like a perfect storm of, um, you know, that allowed, you know, it was the condition, it was the perfect conditions after that happened to generate enough current to damage the module and create that event happening. Uh, so one, the, you know, I, I talked about how we're gonna be changing our, our, our 
you know, some of our processes, some of the specifications that we have on our drawings. Um, you know, I know that Northwest Renewables is obviously has been talking with their crews um, to, you know, reiterate that they're double checking that they are following um, and installing to plan. Um, and if they're going to make any de deviation, they need to be making or creating an RFI that then goes to our electrical engineer. Um, that's a standard practice. The thing here, though, is they didn't real realize that they were deviating from the plan. It was a mistake. Um, human yeah. error. That's hard to. It's a big one. It's a big one. Yeah. Or experienced people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so what a couple other things that we want to do um, going forward in all of our projects is to make sure that um, we have a, a, chem, a dry chemical fire exchanger, an ABC fire exchanger on site during construction and then leave it with the customers um, just as a precaution. Um, so there is one on site right now. Um, and then also, uh, and we, we like to do this even if this hadn't happened, we do this with um, at other areas. We like to support our local uh, fire responders, first responders, um, on education and proper procedures to res you know responding to an incident with a solar array. So um, we just hadn't gotten there yet. So normally, a part of the process is at the very end, part that you know we do the training with. The, the owner of the system, but we also uh, reach out to the local fire department and see if they want to bring any of their folks on site and we can walk through with them how to, uh, you know, turn the system off, um, you know, the, you know, provide them resources if they want or need them on, you know, how best to uh, address a solar system if there ever was um, an incident. Um, that being said, uh, combustion of solar panels is rare. Like if you look at the statistics, this is not common. Um, but you know, it's better be prepared and have people know. Okay. So um, questions? Any questions? Any something right. about Jessup? I, I just like learning about. Yeah. Um, so if I understand correctly, right, so we're we're pulling air again. If you do that in a battery car, it just smoke pretty quick. This is one of those ones that took a bit. Obviously, a big, big error. Um, however, if I understand the process correctly, it just simply happened in between inspections. So you typically have because it's not quite operational yet. You're right. about to make it operational with the rest of the systems. Yeah, and so inspections work along the way. Correct. So when you did it, just, this happened in between inspections. Correct. Right. And you got, yeah, all right. So essentially, it's one of those deals where you probably still make it referring to. Is there, so forgive my ignorance on yeah. how fancy these are. <laughs> so so we, we know we leave them and got them working. Mm -hmm. We're heading out. Are there sensors that exist to monitor these types of things? Not. Per se, fire. So code has it so that if, and Jared, if you're on here and I, yeah. I speak incorrectly, uh, so anything on a rooftop, you have to have rapid shutdown devices on each module. Right. Ground mounted systems, that is not a requirement. Okay. And that's a that's a fire code, uh, you know, kind of, sure. of thing. Um, we do have a data acquisition system that is part of this, um, and it is not operational yet because the system is not operational. Um, but once it's interconnected, that system will monitor the amount that's being produced. So some spikes. It, you know, if if or if I mean there's all these safeties and redundancies in the system. So there's fuses at the inverter. Okay. So if it had gone past the module and to the inverter, a fuse would have blown. Yes. Um, and you know, an error would have went off in the inverter, or something would have went to the data, the data acquisition system, um, and you know, some alarm probably would have went off and it's in place when it's operational and working. Yeah, if yeah. if the DAS was operational, we would have seen it. Um, it would have triggered a warning through the data acquisition, and we would have known that. Um, one string was not operating the rest of them, we would have seen that loss in production. 
uh, we wouldn't necessarily see exactly where it happened, but we would have known there was a problem. Triggered somebody to come out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Nothing from Council Member Williams. <laughs> okay. A resident engineer. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is right up her alley. Yeah, like, I think you know, my history, my history friends are always, you know, not my period. Well, electrical, not my field. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> but it sounds like, as far as process goes, you're doing everything right. So good job on that. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you both very yeah, much. Thank and you. Coming online, we appreciate the explanation. I know there was some we were we were shocked when it happened. Yeah, we all, <laughs> we all were. <laughs> it's not the call I like to get on a on a, a Sunday. Um, it's not the call I like to get on a Sunday. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We will get you up and running, and I would say that's me for so. Great. All right. We should have that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next is the payment rate and screening study. Mr. Rizzatello, you are up. Hey, thank you. Uh, so lately last year, you all authorized us to essentially get a capital asset payment management services under contract to do a payment management report. Uh, this is the first very professional report where they actually like drove the every block and was in essentially marked up a actual database of what condition it's in. Because before we never really had registered engineers doing that block by block. Historically, it was essentially uh, how Paul felt it was <laughs> history. <laughs> we'll kick it around a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was dovetailed with that. And then really with our federally classified roads, it was what we could get grants for and what we could federally classify. And as I mentioned before, our ability to federal classify additional is pretty much a zero because already we're on a bit of shaky ground there. Uh, so the key items to take a look at is like page four, just because I'm definitely more of a big picture person. So what are the points it's driving home? Uh, so pretty much as far as the liability need, uh, as far as stuff that's starting to decay over the next several years, they have it around like roughly 10.8 million. And, and uh, essentially they have various options where if it was like an unconstrained, hey, we're gonna fix um, everything uh, over the next six years, uh, it'd be approximately 2.2 million, that would be unconstrained need. The uh, current funding, which for the local roads, as I mentioned, is the gas tax, which is on the decline because you have electric vehicles and fuel efficient cars. Right now it's 95,000 a year in decrease. And so if we uh, kept it that the estimated PCI change would decrease by about three points. And keep in mind that uh, pavement rains go zero to 100. And right now, uh, uh, current PCI is 74, so that would decrease to 71. And as you look through the charts, you have a period where it's a slow decline and then it just drops quick. Uh, number three uh, is trying to maintain your uh, PCI of the 74, which is essentially the median that exists right now. And essentially that throws around $300,000 out of the year. And then you'll see what the breakout is there. And then essentially uh, number four is uh, 800,000. And you'll see that that would get it up about five uh, points. Uh, naturally money doesn't come out of thin air with the sort of stuff. So, I mean, with the federally classified roads, we get the grants with the local roads. Uh, the, only, the only really viable option, if we wanted to uh, get one of these other options on the table is actually very similar to what City of Walla Walla did about roughly 11 years ago, which they did the voter approved transportation benefit district sales tax 
because then the folks are visiting your community. They're helping you uh, pay for it. And we do have a lot of the regional drivers here, which people patronize, such as the Walmart, the Home Depot, the Goodwill, and so on and so forth. Also, an item of interest, I included it just for historical knowledge uh, in the agenda packet. Uh, but going back, believe it or not, uh, six years, uh, we went to the trouble of creating a transportation benefit district. We just never assigned a revenue to it. So it legally exists. In fact, we get audited to it, even though there's nothing being collected in it. So uh, it's a legal district that's hanging out there, but that uh, doesn't collect anything. Uh, if you want, uh, and there's a lot of data as far as what roads go first and last and what treatment there is, uh, page 116 to 123 in the documents give a good graphical representation via map depending on like what options uh, to choose, uh, essentially what roads would get like what treatment and so forth. So you'll be able to see that right there. Uh, in essence, uh, the Utilities and Transportation Advisory Commission, uh, they wrote, uh, voted to essentially uh, recommend uh, with some uh, edits to type of roads and executive summary, which is now in this document. Uh, Economic Development Commission, uh, it's been presented to them. They're going to be uh, taking a vote on it uh, soon as well. And basically what the first vote is, is I would say accepting this report is the findings of fact is, if you will, like that in general, the governing body agrees with it. And then the part two uh, will be essentially figuring out, do we address it? The, the do we address it part, uh, frankly, is the TB, the TBD because of the roads that you'll see in there. The roads that uh, we're doing really uh, good at uh, are ones with, that were federally classified. So uh, in the future, yes, we can deal with large 12th and mid-January with grants. However, the way all grants are structured now is that you need a local match regardless. And uh, the local match is in the range of 20 to 25 percent. And these projects are ever increasing. So like for just to give you a little flavor, for instance, so like Najatia Road, when you look at some of the original CFPs where we were starting to deal with the idea of Najatia Road six years ago, that was originally thought to be around two and a half million dollars. By the time that we build this thing, it's going to end up being about, frankly, engineering and construction and railway acquisition around nine million. And that's due to inflation uh, and then truly understanding what's there as well. Because a lot of the a lot of the older roads, and again, this is going anecdotally historical. I mean, some of them, what we've done in the past is just chip seal over chip seal over chip seal. And at a certain time, you basically sacrifice your whole base if you're just doing a Jenga series of chip seals at that point. Uh, so I think this is a really uh, important report. It's definitely a first professional one we've ever had. Uh, so I'll take questions the best I can, but I just want this in front of you all uh, to really dig into it. Like what, what sales tax percent did Walla Walla implement and what do you think we'd have to? So, so it would, so they basically implemented the 0 0.1 uh, and you can do 0 0.3. I would, if we were to do it, I would recommend the 0 0.1 so that way it's synonymous across borders and we'd still be cheaper than them because of some other taxes they've done over the years. Uh, so we would, so we, uh, we would still be cheaper that way. And Based on my projections as of late, seeing some of the new retailers that have come in here and stuff, we would probably be pulling around half a million now a year. Okay. Which that that basically that basically gets <laughs> gets you right in the middle around mm -hmm. that uh, or around like that item uh, three. Basically, it gets you to. 
between the options of like uh, three and four between the maintain and trying to improve a little bit, we wouldn't be getting 800, but at least you're getting like in the median. And I want to make sure this was on front of you because as I said, I mean, uh, the gas taxes on the decline and the, there are talks at the state level about changing how they're doing all of that. But those talks have been swirling for years, so I'm fairly pessimistic that will ever occur. So we have the hands that were dealt. Mike, I see that we have a number of streets with PCI between 10 and 20, which yeah. is really bad. Oh, yeah. Um, are we going to, how can I, are these the kind of, the type of streets that we can't get grant funding to fix? Yeah. But yeah, and, and that's, and that has been the reoccurring issue here because the ones that I would say are where uh, they're not as severe and then we get grants and people are like, why are you fixing them? Well, it's because they qualify for grants. So we don't want them to get to a 10. However, and I know some who've been around here for a while can remember this, the street behind my old rental, uh, Southeast 9th. In fact, we've received petitions on that one uh, to fix it because it's actually a, it's actually a dirt road uh, that goes to houses. Uh, but it, you can't get federally classified. The counts on that are less than 50 cars a day, and that doesn't cut it. Um, another one, which is a prime example, is uh, Cedar Avenue between A and C Street. That one, utilizing a construct that worked in Colfax, I tried to get transportation improvement for it a couple of years ago to just tack on Cedar when we were doing C oh, Street, right. because in Colfax, we had a street that was like adjacent to a federally classified street. And over there, they felt bad for us and allowed us to just throw it in there. But uh, apparently they weren't supposed to do that and they don't do that anymore. So they ordered us to take out Seether. So uh, Seether, while we have it fully engineered and everything, we cannot get state money for that. And in fact, because the counts don't meet that threshold, uh, we I can't get it federally classified because it really doesn't go to a landmark or anything. Now, Damson, uh, we lumped Damson in with that C Street project. Luckily, it has a Presbyterian church on there. And then I made an argument about the vacant Google and Mellie land that they could have businesses on it. So uh, the state actually bought that, and then we were able to federally classify that, and that's how we got the grant for a year ago rebuild it. But I just tell that anecdotal story where Cedar's a prime example. In fact, I believe there were a couple people who live on Cedar a couple of years back that testified at a council meeting about the uh, condition of it. But uh, with those local roads, you cannot get grant dollars for them. So pretty much the only way we're going to be able to take care of our residents' roads, our residential roads yeah. where people live, is find um, a funding alternative, which is going to be that sales tax. Yeah, yeah, and it would be a voter-approved sales tax, and then and then you can whittle away on these local roads because that that right there is the issue uh, with, with the local with the local roads. The best we can do right now is we have our REIT one where it's dedicated where we do our trip seal, we're able to try to overlay a block of road a year. And then that's frankly right. it. It's not enough. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's nice to be, you know, something like that sales taxes, we get visitors to help us pay yeah. for our roads that they're driving on. Okay. Other questions, Council Member Jessup? Would this also, the funds uh, with an equal uh, sales tax, which would still then be cheaper than Wall Wall, if I understood yeah. correctly, in terms of the sales yeah. tax, would this also be able to help pay for? I see a lot of the, the very poor and poor are next to like Garrison Creek, uh, new, uh, the, uh, we incorporated uh, um, by Stone Creek. And also a couple spots that are leading to like Lions Park. Yeah. So like things in which uh, people are using, and would that help with like being able to fund things to help keep you know road waste out of the creeks and all that kind of good fun stuff too to kind of keep us in compliance with yeah. waste. Well, well, yeah. Some like, more stuff. 
Well, yeah, like for instance, 10th Street's a prime example. So 10th Street, that needed to be re redone in Southeast 10th from Birch to College. We've had, because it was dumping untreated stormwater right in Garrison Creek, sheet draining, uh, we had the stormwater utility pay for all of that. And uh, that's why I get a lot of questions about, hey, why would you rebuild a road and not put a sidewalk next to it? Well, that's why we had a stormwater utility pay for that because it was sheet draining and we had to crown it the right way, but you can't be using the stormwater money to go build pedestrian infrastructure. And with the traffic counts being as low as they are, you can't get grants to match that at all. And then the, and this is an issue I have with the state, but then it further compounded it with the community development block grant funds, they have a rule at the state level where if let's say the road is getting near the boundary of like your census block group, they just won't grant it because their argument is, oh, well, the rich block group is benefiting. So it's like, for instance, first year I was here, I tried to put in a grant to them to go redo Birch uh, between like, for instance, 4th and 12th, but the census block group uh, between the qualifying track and then the non-qualifying one literally runs right down the middle of Birch. And then they disqualify it because they were like, oh, well, the rich block group would benefit. And I feel they all weigh a director and they they uh, died on that at all. Yeah, so this fund would help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This fund would help. Yeah. yeah. Other questions or comments? All right. Sorry, I was commenting with my mute button on, which was not helpful. <laughs> uh, this is Council Member Williams, and I just want to say um, I did grill Mike pretty well at the utilities at the. Oh, you muted yourself again. Oh, oh I think because she muted the camera, turned her off. Oh. Is she or did she go disappear? You're muted. Sorry, am I muted again? I you are now we can hear you. Okay. I have no idea when I got lost. So anyway, um I did grill Mike pretty strongly at our UTAC meeting, and I do think that this is very timely and it's very critical. Um we talked over and over again about our streets, and there's just no other way around it. We are going to have to find a funding source. Um, and we might be able to convince some people to give us some catch up grants, but I don't think anyone's going to do that unless we've shown that we're serious about doing what we can to fund it, to fund the long-term maintenance. So, um, I think this is a, a good study that we should accept. And I think we're going to have to think really seriously about the sales tax or some other funding source. I agree. Yep. This, who did this, but this then put us in a position to be able to use leverage any of these dollars for matching so that yeah. it would actually. Yeah. Okay. So, so for. Double down. Yeah. So for instance, we put in for community development block grants to do sidewalks in the streets that don't get near a border for the rich block group. Uh, <laughs> the the issue, and this is another quandary I'm now getting into how we've gotten uh, the money prior is that because we had no match money, I went to Walla University and was like, hey, can you donate right away? And then I can say it's a match and then we'll go get money. And they did, and then that's how we got the grant money for the sidewalks on Davis, Bade, uh, and then even the next ones that we're now doing on 6th, uh, they donated right away, and I counted that as a match, and then the state gave us money. My issue is we are now out of the streets where they own enough, like, right away or anything where it would make it done. So what 
when I put in these community development block grant applications, like last year, I tried to get a grant to go run sidewalks down B Street. The university doesn't have property down B Street. And then you talk a lot of folks, they want money for the right way, which we have no money for that. So then I turned in the application anyway, but it was pretty please give us money and we don't really have a match and then we didn't get it. So uh, we're in a situation with that now because we're we've done the streets where the university has significant right away to donate to us for a match. Other questions or comments? All right. Let's see the last item on the agenda is fiscal year 2023 community grant program recommendation allocations. Okay. Uh, thank you. So as you all may recall, uh, uh, every year, if there's room left in the budget, you all put money into a line item for community grants. We do a call for projects for items to help with vitality, art, health, economic development, uh, put the call out, and then essentially uh, agencies can put in grant requests in past years. Uh, it's hovered. Uh, first year was like the COVID tester machine over at uh, Providence. Then we had a break year, but then last year we ended up with about uh, four requests. And then this year, uh, we actually end up with eight hey, applications. So the word is getting out there. Uh, I wish to thank uh, three individuals because uh, we have representative from three of our advisory boards forming ad hoc committee to grade them, to grade the proposals. So uh, Dan Thessman with the Utilities Commission, Jenna Bicknell with the Park and Rec Board, and then Bruce Moorhead with the Economic Development Commission. Uh, but as it stands, uh, they wanted to get the money as far as possible to fund, to fund as many requests as possible. So what they recommended was for the uh, bike and pet committee from Walla Walla because they're doing very wide bike route maps. Uh, their full request of five hundred dollars. Uh, Walla Walla Sustainable Living Center. They're doing a farm and table project uh, here in town. So five thousand. That would be their full request. Uh, Sunbridge is scaling up uh, their park and rec program basically for uh, for uh, older kids in town here. So 4,000, so full request for uh, the Common Roots Land Trust. They put in an application uh, and the Ad Hoc Committee recommended a grant 46% of the request. So 3,450, the Walla University Tool Library, uh, they put in a request, they said to uh, recommend it to grant uh, $1,610 of that. Uh, Accessible Walla Walla put in a request for, uh, and they recommended to do $340, so 46% of the app per request, and the last two to grant 33% uh, of the request respectively, uh, which was for uh, Gearson Creek Heights uh, block party at 100 bucks, and then in Actus they have uh, $1,320. Uh, but you'll see attached is the summary uh, sheet and the respective applications. On your summary sheet where you have your, yep. your your list and then your request option one, yeah. option two. Yeah. On your option two, your total doesn't total. Oh, it should be 16,320 yeah. as your total. The inactus one is not included in your $15,000. Okay. Well, okay, well, right. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, wait, how are those yeah. the same when you've got to? Well, so anyway, the, so uh, okay, I'll recalibrate that, but, but essentially they had the ad hoc group. They were just trying to get the money to as many of the applicants as yeah. uh, possible. So that was how they uh, agreed that essentially the top three were valid enough to get the full request and then they uh, tapered it down for the others. And that's what you see in front of you. I'll re Thanks for a catch. I Sorry. saw what I caught. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I missed one earlier and then I fixed it, but apparently I missed 
something else, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's what you see in front of you. But it's good that we're getting the word out there. I mean, it basically the request doubled from okay. last year. That is good. Yeah. Our organizations, our more communities uh, within College Place are getting yeah. more, yeah, the Surf College Place are getting yeah involved yeah and benefiting from this fund these funds yeah. And this time it was a lot of uh, agencies where, uh, like the last time, it was a, a lot of the folks we partner with were, uh, where I would say they pay attention on our social media and website. This time it wasn't. So it's getting out to a greater community. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Good. Any questions or comments? And I thank you actually for every uh, grant application you get awarded in a college place, you earn a mistake. So I can... <laughs> uh, <laughs> <be good. laughs> Any other questions or comments? Oh. All right. We are coming down to the closing then, and Council Member Williams has something for good of the order. Oh, you're on mute. Um, some of you probably remember my college palace pillow. Well, today I was at the same place and they now have college place pillows where college place is spelled correctly. So oh, I had to get one. Palace. <laughs> yes, I had to get one so I would have the matching set. And when I was checking out, uh one of the women was like um I said well I have to have one because I you know am on the council and she's like oh I live in college place and I'm so happy with what's going on in the city she said it's like we have our own identity now we have our own parades we have events we have the college market we have our own library and I was like well you know we really have a really amazing uh administrator and staff and mayor and council so I'm glad that you're happy. And I just thought I should do that. That's lovely. Yeah. That is very lovely. Good compliments. Yeah. Um, encouragement, right? Yeah. That lets us know that we are working in the right direction. Yep. It's always helpful to know that people are happy. Thank you, Melody. Yeah. People are never going to call up and tell you that, but you know, every once in a while you can uh, <laughs> find it in the wild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it really is true. So that's great. Okay. Thank you. Any other item for good of the order? Well, maybe we should just change the name of the city so that they don't update their pillows. So college Palace? Or we're going to do Collage Palace. You know? <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I felt like, you know, maybe that should be my, uh, when I run next time, that should be my slogan, you know. Where would you rather live, College Place or College Palace? Uh, well, you go turning College Place into College, college Palace. Collage Palace. <laughs> college Palace would be, especially since we don't have a college anymore. Yeah, we got the university. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah man, I but think of the stationary costs. Right. right. <laughs> All the name tags. Yeah. All right. we do like learning instead or learning palace, right? There you, go. there you go. All right. If there's nothing else for good of the order, I conclude the workshop at 6.58 p.m. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Oh.